One of the things that has been asked about by various different um, viewers many times has been how do you create input uh, for their 8-bit computers? I've had people message me on my website, ask about how you generate uh, uh, keyboard drivers and things like that. And it got me thinking that um, a keyboard matrix is something that's talked about in a lot of other areas of um, electronics pretty often. For example, there's probably three million examples on the Arduino. But there's not really anything whenever it comes to a 8-bit computer. And... I think that's important to take a look at because unlike an Arduino, which is essentially a computer on a chip, there's not really onboard I.O. in the sense that um, you've got p digital pins that are either high or low. You can write them, read them, you know. You don't really have that on the Z80. It's a basic processor which you have to add things to. So I decided that it's about time that I sat down, went over um, some of the styles of um, hardware that you can use to create keyboard matrices that you can read to or uh, read from and write to as well as um, you know some of the things that might be needed in software in order to be able to make these things work whether they be drivers or just um, you know general algorithms on how you would um, you know make a particular piece of hardware function and actually determine which key it was that was pressed so sit down, enjoy the ride. Uh, if you have any questions, post them below. We're going to take some look at some hardware first, and afterwards we will get into software. All right? This is an example of a keyboard matrix that's being driven by two separate registers. Now, with registers, what I'm referring to is one is an octal latch, and the second is a bus transceiver. Now, let's talk about the circuit just a little bit. First off, we have our address decoding. Um, we're decoding the um, lower seven or lower eight address lines as well as read, write, and I.O. request. Now, th this is uh, designed for a Z80 bus. So if you're using something else, you'll have to figure out your own address decoding. But what we can actually do is we can um, basically, um, we can decode this down to where it's um, a single address location that has both a, uh, a read and a write. So we could, for example, use address location 01 read and address location 01 write. And what we're doing is basically just generating two chip select sign, or, uh, signals. And the reason why we have to have these is because we have two different chips. Now the first one is the octal latch. In this example, we're using the 74HC574. And what we can do is we can actually um, write a value to that latch, which will then um, write the columns um, either high or low. So for an example, we might write a 01, or a, yeah, a 01, which would write um, column 1 high. Uh, 2 would write column 2 high. 4 would write column three high, eight would write column four high, and so on until we get to column eight. Now, whenever we write that value to the um, columns, we then would turn around and read from that same port reading in the um, row. And what the row is going to tell us is if there is a um, key that's been pressed. So for an example, if we write a one to the 74HC574, it's going to light up column 1 with a high signal. And if we press switch 64, whenever we read that value in, it's going to show us that row 8 is high. And if you do your job right and you put um, um, diodes in here, then you can actually uh, keep it from um, ghosting keys on you and things like that. So um, you always want to make sure that you use those. But this is a real simple way of um, building a keyboard. This is what I did with my first computer project. Um, if you remember, I actually had the um, um, the Z80 on a large piece of perf board with all the switches and things like that. Well, this is essentially the uh, approach that I uh, went with, although it was a little bit different. What I actually did under those circumstances is I had um, just eight switches, 
and I would write a value to that port and then I would read in from that same port so I was reading eight lines with eight lines and that was pretty inefficient looking back that was a bad way of doing it but it allowed me to create a monitor with a very small overhead I think my monitor for that computer was only in the area of maybe three or four hundred bytes of data so it because I didn't have a whole lot of um, decoding to do in software to figure out which key it was that was pressed it actually went um, pretty small but with a large amount of uh, wiring and chips and everything else so if I were going to go back and do it all over again I would probably do something more akin to this because I would be able to add in a lot more switches save a lot of board space and at the same time be able to uh, you know have it a, in a very reasonable amount of uh, memory and ROM so this is just one example there's others I'm going to show you another one here in just a moment that is um, address multiplexed which is a very interesting way of doing it and it actually works pretty well so uh, as long as you you know keep the speed under uh, you know let's say uh, five or six megahertz on your Z80 processor you shouldn't have any problem doing it anything higher than that you probably have some issues with um, you know being able to uh, actually read the values in due to propagation delay and things like that but given it is what it is uh, it's a very good way of doing it but this is just a one example here it's the um, you know two register method of doing it um, you write a byte out you read a byte in um, it takes a little bit of overhead whenever it comes to doing your um, um, driver for um, you know actually reading from the keyboard but it's not too big but there's other ways of saving the board space and we'll take a look at that next so here is an example of a address multiplexed keyboard uh, matrix. It's pretty straightforward. Um, in my last example, I did a, um, or I showed you how you could use two uh, registers. For example, a um, 245 transceiver along with a uh, 574 uh, 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 octal latch in order to be able to write two. Um, the columns and then read from those uh, rows. This approach is a little bit different. It cuts your uh, assembly for actually getting the key press in half. And what I mean by that is that you don't need to write to a register in this example. Um, this example we're actually using the address lines to be able to decode down to the columns and then we're just reading any key presses in on the rows. So let's take a look at how this works. We have our address decoding down here, and we're going to be decoding the IO select or the IO uh, request, the read A7, A6, A5, A4, and A3. And depending upon where at in your memory map you want it or your IO space, you can actually use this to generate a chip select uh, signal. In this particular case, it needs to be a active low signal. Okay. And the reason for that is is because the 74LS245 requires a active low uh, chip select pin. Okay. Now, we're going to use the other three address elements to basically multiplex the um, the columns. It's not too different from what the ZX Spectrum and ZX81 did, or if you're we're here in the U.S., the Timex Sinclair. It used the address pins to be able to um, send out the column lines, and we're doing the same thing here. So, what we're going to do is um, we're going to read from, let's say, address zero zero, and what that's going to do is it's going to throw up a high because whenever we read from zero zero, it's basically going to gate the address lines first. So uh, all three of these are going to be low, which means that column one will go high with the 74LS238. So this will go high, and if we have switch 40 pressed, then it's going to show as a high on row five right here. And whenever we read that data in, when, uh, due to the timing, the uh, I.O. request and the read line, uh, they, they actually go active low a little bit later. Uh, I, I think it's one clock cycle after the uh, address is uh, displayed. But as soon as it goes low, it's going to read that data in on the um, data line. Uh, it'll be D5 because it's just going to uh, bring it in from row 5 and transpose it over to D5. So it's going to read um, 
you know, row five is being high. And at that point, you know which key it was on that column that was pressed. Now, then we would have to check to see the second column. So we'd read from address zero one, and that would cause column two to go high and column one to go zero. Same with column three, same with column four, same with column five, because all you're doing is you're changing the address on the A0, A1, and A2 lines, which is going to select only one column at a time for going high. If you read in the rows at the same time, you're going to find out whether or not a key was pressed in that column. So it's really straightforward. It's a fast way of getting data um, from your keyboard matrix. You don't have to worry about writing a byte and then reading a byte and then writing another byte and then reading another byte. You just read eight bytes in a row. You know whether or not a key was pressed or whether multiple keys were pressed. And then at that point, you go on about your business. Okay? And of course, you would have to figure out which. Uh, you know, character it was or what action it needs to take in software. So that might be a little bit, um, you know, of overhead whenever it comes to memory. But generally speaking, it's not going to be that bad. You may have, you know, let's say, you know, three to five hundred bytes and figuring out a keyboard um, routine. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be that bad. You're not talking about, uh, you know, a ton of memory that you're going to be burning doing that. So if you want a really quick way of, um, you know, getting data in from that keyboard matrix, you might look at this example because, again, you don't have to both read a byte and write a byte out. You just go ahead and, um, you know, read from each one, and then you can figure out exactly um, you know what it is in software so it'd be a real quick driver for just getting the keys in all right so I hope you like this example so let's talk about software for a minute software is a very interesting part of trying to figure out how you're going to interface the keyboard with the computer itself and the reason why I say that is because there's so many different ways that you can do it. Now, obviously, there's an infinite number of ways that you can put the hardware together, and there's an infinite number of ways that you can write the software to interact with said hardware. So let's just talk a little bit about the routines themselves. Now, with a keyboard that is going to be either address-driven or um, uh, two registers, where you would write one register and then um, read back from that, you're going to um, have to cater your software to the specific application that you have. So I don't know what layout keys that you would use, and I'm not sure exactly what features that you would want that keyboard to have. But let's just speak about this in a general 64-key, um, 8-column um, by 8-row keyboard. That way we can just narrow it down to exactly what we would need to do. So one of the first things that we would need to do is, is to write a routine. Um, we can consider it to be a um, kind of a, um, a main um, program, so to speak. So every time that the computer wants to see if there's a key that's been pressed, it would call this routine. And this routine would then decide to um, do one of two things. It can either, if, depending upon whether or not it's uh, the two registers or the single address driven um, register, it would decide um, either A, to write a value to the port, or B, just begin reading from those ports. Now, ideally, if you were using an address-driven display, this would be pretty easy. You would be able to, um, let's say, uh, read from all eight ports, and then you could simply OR those values to determine whether or not there was a positive value in there by oring those values any value that is one or higher is going to become um, noticeable and it's going to set the zero flag or the z flag and then that would tell you exactly which key was pressed but on the um, two register uh, set that's a little bit different because you would have to write the value and then read and then you could or it and if it's not pressed you can go to the next uh, but it is a cycle like that. And then once you actually determine which key it is that's pressed, you have to be able to assign some type of value to that key. So then you have to have some type of um, identity type uh, routine that would go through there and compare it to um, various different values to determine what, 
character it is that you're actually wanting to assign to that and it can be an ascii value or it could simply just be a um you know a random uh you know value between 0 and 255 that you want the computer to act in a certain way if it's pressed it doesn't really matter so that's kind of what you're looking at you have to decide which uh type of hardware you're going to go with before you can decide which type of um software that you're going to apply to that hardware um, now having said that there's an infinite number of ways to do this uh, personally the way I like to do it is I like to assign a um, you know a set of values in ROM that I can call to that in almost a lookup table type of um, program it, it tends to be a lot faster doing it that way although it does take up more memory um, but it does seem to be faster and whenever you're talking about pulling a keyboard that can be a slow process and especially if you're running basic or some other um, you know very um, time sensitive or time intensive program you know something that's running a lot of uh, clock cycles that can be pretty um, uh, time consuming and really slow down the computer and your program so it really just comes down to what you're trying to achieve if you're wanting something that goes for speed a lookup table approach would probably be better if you're looking for something that um, you know can just really dive in there then you can do it however you'd like but lookup table is probably the uh, easiest and most practical means of doing it but as far as software goes that's what you're looking at now there are some other factors to take into consideration obviously how much um, memory size you plan on dedicating to ROM and if you are planning on running for example um, basic um, let's say you're running uh, 8k basic and you're wanting to implement a keyboard driver well, I'm just going to be honest with you, you're probably not going to have enough room on an 8K EEPROM in order to do that. You're probably going to want at least 16K of memory in order to be able to implement all your I.O. routines. And that's just the I.O. routines for the keyboard. You're probably going to have other things as well. For example, you may have something for a uh, cassette tape interface, or you may have something for uh, video or maybe serial drivers, whatever it may be. But in either case, you're going to have more than just the ROM there for basic. And that's probably the reason why so many people have actually used the serial interface over the years is because it really does, uh, A, cut down on the amount of hardware that you have to have, a, but B, it really does slim down the amount of code that you have to write in order to be able to get the computer to function. So again, it really comes down to what you're aiming for. If you're really wanting to see how far you can push it, obviously a keyboard's the way to go, and of course you'd want to have some type of video interface as well, but it really just comes down to what you're looking for. Well, I hope you liked the video. I tried to cover the basics here. There's nothing about this that is too advanced um, for the obvious reasons, but you know this is what I'm getting at with this video is if you do want to create some type of keyboard for your own personal computer or maybe you're even trying to integrate the uh, the G80S into um, some type of larger enclosure to be able to uh, utilize it with modified um, ROM whatever the case is it really comes down to creativity you can use any type of hardware that you want to achieve what you're trying to achieve and as long as you have a basic understanding of how the software works and the th types of things that you need to be thinking about in order to be able to achieve your um, goals that's all that really matters so bear that in mind we don't do this just to copy everybody we, we are in this hobby because we like creating things and uh, coming up with unique solutions so bear that in mind every single solution that you come up with is going to be unique it's not going to be identical to what somebody else um, down the street does and if all you want to do is copy other people's designs fantastic but there's something to be said about uh, trying to create something new and I think that's um, all I've ever tried to do with this channel is to try to create something new and share it with the world so having said that that's all that we've got for today um, check out the uh, Retro Depot Facebook page obviously I've mentioned this a couple dozen times before but um, you know we're still uh, posting things on there uh, pretty frequently and of course you can also check out the website uh, new uploads um, every now and then on that 
Um, a lot of times I'll end up posting something on either the Facebook page or the website without even doing a video over it. So keep that in mind. If the only thing that you're doing is watching the videos, you're not getting the full story of what's going on in the day-to-day -day workings. So um, thanks for watching the video. If you have any issues um, or complaints or questions, you know how to um, do it. Either leave a comment below or contact me through the website, Facebook, or my email. All right. Thanks and have a great day.